And here's good. Yeah, just kind of in that little cubby corner. All right, let me get it started for you. All right. Ready to start? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think most everybody's here and sort of seated. Um, so welcome. Tonight's lecture is going to be on traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Hathaway. Um, I am certified in veterinary acupuncture. And it's been one of the best things I've ever done in my life. I love it to pieces. So um, if anybody doesn't, we're all good. I don't know if people get started. Um, you can hit okay. It's not okay. Just there. So the first question, of course, is what is uh, traditional Chinese medicine? I think that a lot of people understand there's needles involved and maybe sometimes herbs, um, but it can be really elusive because our society doesn't really embrace that, so it's not something a lot of us are familiar with unless we go out of our way to learn about it. So basically, um, it's a more than 5,000-year-old practice based on the understanding that the basic life force of all beings, which is qi, Travels along meridians in the body. Okay, next. Oh, sorry. And you can see, can you kind of see like where you are there? Sure. Okay. In case you okay. So I put this slide in because it might be a little bit of a bumpy road here. Um, my goal is to try to give you guys some back, some background on the theories and terminology that are used in Chinese medicine, and then talk a little about the Chinese medical examination. So that's what we'll do for your pet when we see them and then go over some of the treatment options that we have available depending on what we find. <clears throat> okay, so theories and terminology. Um, basically, ooh, that's exciting. Um, these are concepts that are used to basically understand the disease process and, and map a path to wellness in, in Chinese medicine. It's a lot different from the physiology and science that you're taught in school but it makes sense in a lot of the same ways once you understand it, and it matches really nicely. So I'm going to try to explain some of those things to you now. So the first everybody is familiar with is the Taiji, and this concept is yin and yang. And if you look at this one in particular, it has even smaller Taijis inside it, and that's basically a way to explain the comparison between opposites that creates meaning for each side, and the way that within anything that is an opposite, there's still a small part of the other thing. So there is a tiny bit of light within the darkness or a tiny bit of darkness within the light. And I'll try to explain that a little bit more in some of the next slides that come up. So there are five principles of yin and yang to try to explain what this is. Um, the first is that everything in the universe has two opposite aspects, yin and yang. And so that means Basically, if anything you can think of, there is an opposite to it. So hard, soft, day, night, um, light, dark, warm, cold, and on and on and on, up, down. And so using this, it helps you to frame one thing against another. And you can, you can compare things not only to their, their opposites in that way, but there's other opposite pairs as well. So it's basically just a relationship between two things. Any yin and yang division can be further divided into yin and yang aspects. So this means that, uh, for example, day and night. If you think of day as yang and night as yin, because it's cooler and darker and it's all the things that are yin, then they're very opposite. But if you look at daytime, um, the evening is cooler than midday. So there's a yin aspect within the yang of that day. And so that's what that principle is talking about, is that it's not just black and white, that only one thing. You can always compare things to each other at deeper and deeper levels. Yin and yang control each other. So the best example I can think of for this is um, all of us have friends, and sometimes we have friends that are a lot different from us or opposite. So yin and yang controlling each other basically means that the opposites keep each other from going too far to the extreme. So I might go out and hang out every night and stay up too late and never get anything done. I might have a friend who would sit home all the time. When the two of us get together, sometimes I get them to come out of their house and other times they get me to just go home and go to bed like I should. So that's that's how I would discuss that relationship. Um, yin and yang usually create each other. So this one is a little more difficult, but it's basically a way of understanding that without an opposite, uh, you don't understand something. So, for example, there would be no 
um, happiness without sadness, you wouldn't have a concept of what it was. There would be no light without darkness. You wouldn't understand what that meant. So, so they create each other because you need the opposite to understand the other part. Okay. And then the last principle is that yin and yang may transform into each other. And that is um, a slightly harder concept, but it's basically saying day turns into night. Um, another example that I like is you may have a really high fever, which is very yang, and then that fever breaks and you get the chills and you're cold, and that's very yin. So that's an example of when they flip and they, they transform into each other. So that's yin and yang. Um, this is just a slide that goes a little bit more into that. I think you can read most of it. So it's talking about opposite sides that are interconnected and inseparable and within each other. So it's just, you can't escape it. There is yin within yang. There is yang within yin, always. It's a continuous interchange between the alternate poles. And then, as I was saying, there, you can break yin and yang things into other parts. So summer is the opposite of winter, and summer is very yang. But summer still has nighttime and daytime. So within that, there's yang and yin properties. So it's just a way of saying that there's always a way to break it down. Um, yang is basically heat, brightness, movement, strength, activity, upward direction, outward direction in the outside of the body. Whereas yin is cold, darkness, passivity, weakness, downward movement, and the inside of the body. So those are the things that we understand once we've learned about Chinese medicine and help us to understand if things are yin or yang. So when yin and yang are out of balance, the body can't protect itself from diseases. And there are three main types of balance that need to be maintained. The first is a balance with the elements and external forces. So we see certain diseases more commonly in the summer than we do in the winter, or other diseases in the winter or the fall or the spring. Depending on what the outside forces and elements are doing, those potential weaknesses are exacerbated in humans and in animals. The second is a balance between individuals and social situations. So this has to do with how an individual is getting along with their friends or their coworkers or their spouse, or how a dog or a cat is getting along with other animals or people in the house. And if that's out of balance, it can cause disease. The third is balance in the body's own internal processes. So this is, um, you can become out of balance and you may find yourself being excessively hot all the time, or excessively cold all the time. And neither of those are normal, that's, that's where you're out of balance. And yin and yang being warm and cool, you can, you can tell that you have an issue in that way. You may also have yin and yang imbalances within the organ systems or different processes in your body. So there's very tiny minute details where that can go in as well, but it's basically those three levels that we're looking at when we're talking about balance. So the five element theory is a new theory. We've talked about yin and yang. Um, this is another way of looking at how um, people interacted with their environments and how different times of the year, different seasons affected everything that people could see. So whether it was themselves, their animals, their crops, the weather, it's a way of looking at all of those things. And uh, the ancient Ch Chinese basically observed seasonal changes throughout the year and came up with this system to note what they saw. And it describes the relationships among a body's internal organs based on which organs fall into each of the elements, as well as relationship between the body and the natural world and the elements in the world, and really even how different personalities interact with each other. And we'll break this down in the next few slides, but essentially every element has organs associated with it, personality types associated with it, seasonality associated with it, and um, you can use all of that to understand how things do and don't relate well. Illustrated by the little lines and, and arrows is basically a normal cycle. So if you, if you look, you can see that the wood is promoting or nurturing fire, and it goes around the circle on the outside, um, each one nurturing like a parent would a child. And that's when the, the um, cycle is working correctly. So if you have a problem or a weakness where one of your elements or one of your systems is not working, then obviously that system can't nourish the next one. And that's how you see a cascade of disease where someone may have an initial problem, and then as they get sicker, you'll see it moves on to one of the next systems because no longer is that circle complete, that cycle is broken. And um, sometimes it even gets so bad that it can go backwards and cause um, problems that way. The red cycle you see is more like a grandparent controlling a grandchild. So 
the water, water element in this example would control fire. So if you have a weakness or a problem in one of these elements where it's not strong enough, then your unruly little grandchild gets out of control and you have an excess or a problem in that. So it's basically looking at all of these things and how they relate. And when there's dysfunction in any of those systems, you can end up with an illness or a problem. Okay, so the elements start with wood. Um, wood is represented by springtime, the color green. And people or pets with a wood personality tend to be pioneer spirits and they lead and can be almost bossy like a general. Um, they tend to be great athletes and the organ systems that are affected and controlled in the wood element are the liver and gallbladder. A typical breed that would be a wood personality dog many, many times, if not always, is a, is a Rottweiler. So certainly there are some that are a fire type of many Rottweilers are like, nope, this is how it's going to go and I'm going to be in control of it and that's how they roll. So it's kind of explained to you how personalities can be noted in your pets as well. Okay. So next is fire and this is the one that comes after wood. So um, wood helps to nurture the fire element. And Fire is represented by all phenomena associated with like summer and heat and redness. Um, a person or an animal who has a fire personality is joyful, laughs a lot, seeks attention, playful. Um, the organs associated with fire, there's many because they have actually a couple sets. So it's the heart and the pericardium and the small intestine and a little uh, system known in Chinese medicine as a triple heater which I think I would equate most easily to something like the endocrine system. And it's basically just moving things up and down in the body. So those four are all associated with fire element. And common breed would be a Jack Russell Terrier. Um, many poodles are also fire personality, little toy poodles that are like, oh, pick me, touch me. So um, just really friendly, outgoing, happy dogs. Okay. Earth. <clears throat> so earth is the mother of all the elements. Even though everything's connected at the circle, earth is where it all starts. You have to have a strong earth element to be okay. Um, if we're using herbs and medicines, if our earth element is weak, that, have, that goes along with digestion. And so we have to get that strong enough to tolerate anything else that we do. And so um, the earth element is basically associated with late summer harvest. And it represents everything related to food and dampness. So uh, dampness is something that's real common in Florida because it's so humid. And so we see in the late summer, which we're not quite there yet, but it sure feels like it, we'll see a lot more um, situations with dampness creeping into our patients because of, of our external environment that's in that element. Um, earth personalities are relaxed and laid back and like to care for others. Um, they typically love sweets and they get like round little bellies and take care of everybody else and themselves last. But um, earth is great. And the organs associated with that are going to be spleen and stomach. So like I was saying, GI issues. Um, it's huge. So um, a lot of people, if their earth personalities, you know, they worry a lot. They, they've taken care of everyone else. They get stomach problems, ulcer, GI problems, IBD, things like that. Um, and then the, the old standard as far as earth element is a Labrador retriever. They're so kind and just care about everybody else, so they're wonderful. Metal. So metal is represented and so things are getting cooler. Um, <clears throat> it's a lighter and superficial element. And people that are of this element tend to be broad-minded and they're organizers and they're leaders. Animals that are metal tend to be um, aloof, not necessarily in a bad way, but they don't necessarily get caught up with all the pack details. They're not the dogs that are going to fight or get hung up in who's visiting or like who's doing what over there. The cat and the dog are fighting. The metal animal is just going to be like, okay, yeah, that's happening. They're fine with it. Um, it doesn't really affect them. The organs most commonly associated with this element are going to be the long and the large intestine. So a lot of the chronic coughing dogs end up being metal. Um, <clears throat> I say as I cough. Um, this one, it, it's, it's essentially going to be primarily greyhounds that you see that are metal, but every now and then, <clears throat> excuse me, every now and then you get a dog that is um, another breed that's, that's pretty metal. Um, I just had one today that is pretty metal and it's just uh, means that you're watching for certain diseases in them that you might not normally see. So water is the next, and water is represented, uh, sorry, represented by winter, coldness, and darkness. And it's a very heavy and a very deep element. Most humans that are water types are philosophers or deep thinkers or just kind of observers. They watch things. 
Uh, most animals that are water personality tend to be fearful, like cute little chihuahuas hiding behind everybody. And um, the organs associated with water element are kidney and urinary bladder. So we'll see kidney problems in those dogs sometimes or dental problems, the, the other things that are associated with that. And as I just said, the chihuahua is the most common breed um, in that. Did we hand out the papers on everything? Not yet. Okay. I, when do you want me to grab them? Because I can let you do it at the end. I'm so okay. sorry. Um, so I have papers that basically go through and one for your pets and one for you that you can look at. And it's really, really short questions for you, like four. I didn't do a crazy long one like we did last year. And it just to give you a basic idea of, of what you might be or what your pet might be. And then if you're interested in this to see how out of balance you are, there are a lot of really great tests online that you can fill out. I think Tree of, Tree of Life has one. And you just click on all the things and it tells you primarily what you are and how out of balance you are in that element. And it can be pretty fun to learn about yourself. And it really is a nice way of looking at how you interact with your world or the people around you. So, okay. okay. The five treasures. Okay, it's getting deep, guys. So these are the things that are necessary to maintain healthy life. So they are not at all, um, well, some of them are, but they're not really typical of what you would understand from a Western uh, medicine standpoint. And so these, um, I won't go into in too much detail, but of them, qi is the most important for your understanding of uh, the basics of traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. So the other, the other treasures are jing, Chen, blood, and body fluid. And that's just sort of to let you know that there's all these other things that we're thinking of and taking into account when we look at your animals. Okay, next. What was the, on? can you repeat for uh, the online one that you said? Tree of life, I Tree think. Of life. Yeah, okay. it was the, and if, if people need references, we could link them later on our page or something. Okay, so Chi is pronounced like C-H-E-E, -E, not, not, Q or Q or so I know Qi. Um, the saying is that where there's Qi, there must be life. And also where there's life, there must be Qi. So Qi is the essential energy. It's like the battery of, of any living thing, whether it's human or plant. Um, qi in the body comes from our food and our environment. So that's why eating good things and breathing in good air and being in a good environment are really important. And they also, it also is associated with our prenatal jing, and so that's basically the essence that you're born with, that you get from your mom. And qi is transformed through a lot of different complicated uh, physiologic processes and turns into the energy that every system needs. So uh, whether it's energy to be moving around or energy for your immune system to take care of you, uh, that is what, that's what qi is for. And she has the following six effects. So it's impelling, uh, which means basically moving. It's warming. It's defending, so that's your immune system. Uh, holding, keeping organs and fluids where they're supposed to be. It has to do with activity, and it's nourishing. So it helps all of the organ systems to be healthy. So chi, let me kind of see it. I tried to get a good picture, but there really there aren't a lot of good ones. But um, as you can see, there's kind of lines that flow. And basically, chi flows along meridians. So the meridians go from up here and down to the distal limb and then back up and along the body and then down the back leg all the way as well and then back up on the inside and back up to the chest. And there's three loops that do that um, with four channels in each. So there are 12 major channels, and then there are... Um, eight others that are extraordinary that connect all different parts of the system. And chi is moving within these. And um, when it's moving smoothly, then, then you have a healthy, normal body. Um, this is the system that we're addressing when we treat animals with acupuncture, when humans get treated with acupuncture. So the acupuncture points are just little spots all along these channels that you can put a needle in or apply pressure to or put a medicine in and affect how well the chi can flow through that area, okay? If that, makes, if that makes any sense. So if there's a problem, then we can alter that problem by putting needles in the right places. Um, the pathologies that can affect chi include deficiency, so that's where you just don't have enough chi, and we can promote that with needles placed in the right points. Um, stagnation, so that's where chi is blocked up and not moving, and you'll mostly know that that's there if there's pain or discomfort or swelling of any type. Um, that's usually a stagnation, and so we know that we can clear those blockages and help the chi move again. Um, rebellion, and that can happen along the meridians or also internally. So chi is supposed to move down if it's your stomach, but if, if um, you have rebellious stomach chi, that's vomiting. 
So that can be a problem. And then collapse is basically when there just isn't enough. And chi collapse is really dangerous because that can lead to your passing, obviously, if chi is something that's very important for your life force. Okay. All right. So we've kind of talked about some of the things that we think about. And so when you have illness in a person or an animal, there are basically three main causes of that. Um, the first would be conflicts between the Zen Qi, which is the immune system. That's one of the types of Qi that we were just talking about. Kind of acts like a nice umbrella, protecting you from anything that's trying to come at you and, and cause you to become ill. And then Shei Qi, which are the pathogens. So everything that is um, something that you're exposed to, whether it's the flu virus or um, excessive heat or dampness, your body's Zeng Qi is trying to protect you against that. So if there's a conflict between your immune system and the pathogen, um, if your immune system is too weak or if the pathogen is too strong or there for too long, then you can end up sick. Okay. The next is yin and yang disharmony. So as we talked about, if, if there's any kind of imbalance in those areas, you can end up with a system that just starts tail spinning and you end up sick from that. And then the last one is disordered ascending and descending chi flow. So that's when something just isn't going in the right direction or it's plugged up and your body can no longer maintain health when that happens. And so um, acupuncture can help reestablish basically all of these things by getting the balance and flow corrected. So now that I'm, you're probably all thoroughly confused, but um, I wanted to talk a little about some of those things. Um, what are we going to do with this? So how do we use these principles to better identify and treat illness and, and ideally even to promote wellness? So this is a picture of a little puppy and he is getting wellness acupuncture just to make sure that as he grows and develops, he does not end up with any deficiencies. And as you can see, he totally hates it. Chewing on his toy. Okay, so now we're into the next section. So that was kind of the really quick and dirty on some of the things that we look at. I did not go into the physiology because it is a super detailed thing that leads to mostly confusion for a couple months until you figure it out. But I'm happy to talk with any of you guys about that more if you'd like. Um, so the Chinese medical examination is obviously the big part of what we do here and, and the most important thing as far as helping to determine what we need to do to help your dog or cat or lizard too. I mean, we can, we can treat a bird. Yeah. So um, the parts of a Chinese medical examination are uh, the normal signalment. So that basically means how old is this animal? Is it spayed or neutered? Um, and we usually include the constitution. So we'll have you fill out paperwork or we'll talk to you and ask you questions because it matters if you have a metal dog or a fire dog or an earth dog as far as what we're looking at is the main source of illness or potentially what they're going to be most susceptible to. The next would be the clinical signs. That's still important, just like it is in Western medicine. We need to know where the problems are. Um, temperature preferences, and that's helping to get to the yin and the yang. Is your dog looking for cool places? It only lays on the tile floor. Is it cold? It only snuggles up in the blanket with you. Um, does it avoid going outside on hot days? Does it pant all the time? Or is it just kind of happily walking around and you don't really notice any problems? So that's one of the things that we talk about. And then we talk about tongue and pulse, which will be on another slide, and that's a way that we can use to look to identify where problems may be. Then there's also back shoe and front new alarm points, and so that is a palpation that we do that looks a lot like a normal exam, and for me, for the early part of my career, was a normal exam. I wouldn't be able to tell you why. Sometimes I felt bumps or divots in certain parts of a dog's spine, but it turns out that's a back shoe point, and so that can tell you who oh, the spot is associated with this system, and that's why there's a problem, and that you have to look more closely and see if that might be where the issue is. Front new alarm points are really cool. Um, they go down along the midline and then up along the ribs. And if you are palpating one of those and the animal's really uncomfortable, you know to look at that organ system for a problem. And you know that you need to address that problem with your treatments. And then part of our Chinese medical examination is the six roots and eight principles, which I will talk about when I get to that slide. And that's basically a way of identifying what we need to treat. Okay, so tongue and pulse diagnosis. I love this slide because it's a lot of pictures of tongues. So um, basically when we look at a tongue, we're looking at the color, quality, and coating of the tongue. 
So a normal, happy dog's tongue should be uh, peach blossom pink is what they say. So it's not red and it's not purple, it's not yellow, it doesn't have a coating, it's just nice and pink. Um, I think the closest to that would be this dog, although the way it can't, comes up on here, it looks like it's a little wet to me, so that's not actually an ideal tongue. But if you look here, you can see that some of these are really purple, and so that's not an ideal tongue either. There, there's stagnation there. So depending on which parts of the tongue are colored in which ways, or what coating is present, or whether or not there are phlegm lines, we can tell a whole lot about how your dog is doing and where their illnesses are likely to be and what we need to do to fix those problems. So true with cats too. Yes. Yep. Oh, can you go back one second? Pulses. Okay. So um, pulsing is when is when we sit for a quite, quite a long time and kind of go like this and uh, using both of the femoral pulses in your dog's back legs or your cat's. <laughs> And what we're basically looking for is, are they normal and balanced? Are they at the appropriate depth? Are they too fast or too slow? Are they moving around a lot? Are they too wide? Are they too thin? Um, and then among that, we use three fingers. And so there are different organ systems associated with each level and at each side. So there's basically six plus things that we're looking at and assessing. And based on how those pulses feel and all of the other things, we can tell okay, well, this dog might be deficient or maybe um, has an excess of yang or there are a whole bunch of things you can tell just by how the pulses feel. My favorite thing about this is that for the first part of my career when I did not know anything about Chinese medicine, even back in school, I would feel pulses that were weird. And I would say, why does this pulse feel like this? And the clinicians would say, I don't know, it's fine. You wouldn't hear a murmur. Or, you know, they match the heart. That's yeah, fine. And that happened forever. I would just be like, man, this feels weird. So when I got trained in Chinese medicine, it was this huge aha moment. Like, oh, these things that I've been noticing for my entire career, yes, they do mean something. And it is amazing. And probably my favorite part of Chinese medicine still, how consistent that is. So you can do that and then ask one of your colleagues, is this what you feel? Or, or just say, better yet, hey, can you go tongue and pulse that dog for me? Let me know what you see and it will match exactly. It, it's crazy because it doesn't make any sense to me. It never did, but it is real. And um, probably this is a good time to mention, there are tons and tons of studies that prove the validity and the usefulness of Chinese medicine. So anyone who's ever saying, like, this isn't real or it doesn't do anything, that's completely false. It's 2019. There are blind studies that show um, endorphins being released. It shows the pain control associated. It shows the, the relief from disease. So it, this is very real, it's just we didn't understand it. And we still strive to understand it better. And the cool thing about Chinese medicine is it's been evolving, evolving for 5,000 years. It's not done. So the more that we add to that knowledge base, the more we understand about how we're helping animals and humans be healthier by using this system. Okay, okay so this is the eight principles and six roots. And this is sort of a way of looking at the yin and the yang in opposite pairs, but it helps us to categorize what diseases we're, we're looking at, where they are, and, and that helps us to know what problems or pathogens might be causing those issues. So I like to, to sort of break it down in hot and cold, so those are opposite pairs. So is this a hot or a cold issue? Is it exterior or interior? That helps us to know if it might be a pathogen or if it's an internal organ issue. And then excess or deficiency. So um, excesses are most commonly found in acute diseases or in young animals, and deficiencies are most common in chronic diseases or in older animals. So you're just making sure that you notice that and make note of it so that you can um, choose your treatments based on that. And then overall, you look at the yin and the yang. So you can have an excess pattern, but a very um, yin patient. Yin is not excess. But you have to look at all of those things to know best how to treat each animal. Okay, so once we get all of that information collected, then we know which issues a pet is most likely to be prone to. We know whether they have excess or deficient patterns. We know whether or not pathogens might be involved. Um, we know the locations or the elements that are affected by their illness. And we know where we can begin restoring balance to the system. And to try to give an example of that, I just I put one kind of mini case study. I call it a tale of two dogs with diarrhea, so it's a little bit sad. I like to think that those dogs do not have diarrhea and are just on a walk together in the woods, but they might, they might have, both have diarrhea. So if I see two or three or four dogs with diarrhea and I'm a Western medicine practitioner only, my 
go to is to look and see if they have any parasites in the stool or if the bacteria is abnormal. Typically, I'm going to treat all those dogs the same way because I'm going to try to use my medicines that control diarrhea. And yes, we have lots and lots of medications that control diarrhea, but we don't really know which ones to pick because if they have these types of bacteria, then maybe these five medicines might work, you know, that kind of thing. Well, in Chinese medicine, you can have a first dog that has mucoid or bloody stool of sudden onset with a really red tongue and really rapid superficial pulses. And then you can have another dog that has diarrhea. It's more watery and kind of chronic. Their tongue's pale and their pulses are weaker. And so the first dog would actually have an excess condition called spleen damp heat. And you have herbs that you pick to clear that. And there are certain acupuncture points to help treat that, as you can see listed over here. And then the second dog actually has a Chinese diagnosis of spleen chi deficiency. So one's an excess, one's a deficiency. We use a completely different herb to treat that dog and completely different acupuncture points. And so, yeah, I mean, there are certain acupuncture points that are just good for diarrhea, but being able to use Eastern medicine to further understand exactly the nature of the pattern allows us to much more effectively treat a patient and get them feeling well again more quickly. So the treatment principles that we apply once we've got this all figured out are essentially to use the opposite, so yin and yang theory, right? So if it's cold, we're going to warm it up. If it's hot, we're going to clear the heat away. If it's stagnant, we're going to relieve the obstruction and restore the flow. If it's deficient, we're going to nourish or tonify it. And if it's excessive, we're going to disperse it. And that goes on and on, but you get the idea, okay? So once we have a pattern diagnosis, and I just put this in, splint flare misting the mind is basically a one, one diagnosis for mental stress and illness. So it's super confusing right now. That's maybe what you have. But um, all of the pattern diagnoses are really cool and completely difficult to understand, but very fun. And so once we have that, we arrive at modalities used for treatment. So shout out, this is my girl Violet. And she had a toothache, and while she was waiting to get in for her dental to fix that, she had acupuncture and stuff on my bed. Um, so the, the three main modalities that we use here, and this is kind of getting into our last segment of the lecture, are going to be acupuncture, diet or nutrition, and herbals. So acupuncture, this is a slide we used from last year but I kind of didn't want to miss any of those things. So it's, it's one of the oldest, um, most commonly used systems of healing in the whole world. And there are over 2,000 acupuncture points on the human body, which are connected by the 20 pathways. We touched on that earlier. The 12 main pathways and then eight secondary or extraordinary channels. They're all called meridians. Meridians conduct energy, or chi, between the surface of the body and its internal organs. So there's all kinds of pathways that you can see, and then there's internal branches. So everything's connected, and everything's flowing together. And um, keeping a balance between yin and yang allows the normal flow of chi throughout the body and restores health to the mind and the body. And veterinary acupuncture was developed from human acupuncture. So you can think of it as, oh, well, that's pretty new. No, it's totally not new at all, because what did the Chinese have? They had horses. They had dogs working on the farms. Those were valuable animals. So people learned how to care for the animals as, as early, or, you know, almost as early as they learned to care for people because losing a horse or a working dog was extremely detrimental to the farm. So there are old texts that have been translated from Chinese to English so that we now have the benefit of going back to the original uh, theories and thought processes and really being able to understand the underlying fundamentals of, of this type of medicine. So acupuncture therapies, and this is a little dog getting electroacupuncture. He had facial nerve paralysis from a severe ear infection, and he didn't mind it at all. Um, putting needles in would be a little tiny bit stressful, and then once the current started flowing, he would just relax. So I kind of want to go through the basics of some of the things that we're treating. And uh, dry needles are the fundamental sort of everyone, what everyone understands about acupuncture. So that's going to be needles put into the points, and left in for anywhere from 10 to 40 minutes, depending on the patient and the, and the illness that you're treating. I mean, realistically, sometimes I've left them in even longer. If the patient needs it and is tolerating it, they just chill out and take a nap. Um, we use different sizes or different depths, depending on what we're trying to accomplish, and basically just make a plan to do all of the things that we need to do to help restore the flow of energy in that animal. So the next is aquapuncture. 
And that is using a fluid. <clears throat> Typically, it's going to be B12 or saline. Lately, I've been experimenting with using injectable medications at points that also are associated with that. So, for example, if your dog is nauseous, we might give um, a Sereni injection but at an acupuncture point for nausea. Um, if your dog has an infection and we have to give a sub-Q injection of something, we might give it at a point that's associated with an organ in that system. So there are different ways that we can play with that. And um, I really like that. The nice thing with it is it, it gives stimulation to that point for a longer period of time. And for animals that don't tolerate sitting still or needles, you can usually get at least a few really good aqua points into them and really make a difference for their healing process. The next is called moxibustion. So this is combined with dry needle therapy. And basically you have dry needles in place. Well, it doesn't always have to be combined with dry needle therapy, actually. You can just use it over the points. And it's essentially lighting this um, herb combination that looks like a big old cigar and has a pretty potent smell and it's very warming. And you just wave that over the areas that are having problems that you want to warm. And it's a really nice treatment for dogs that are deficient or cats or humans. And um, it can really bring a lot of energy and a lot of healing and return to function to those animals very quickly. The next is electroacupuncture. That is combined with dry needles. So if you can sort of see here, these are all little copper-headed dry needles, um, copper handles, sorry, in the dog. And then we connect the electrode to that so it's metal. And then it's hooked up to, um, I think there's one on the next page. But anyway, it's hooked up to a little unit. And you can control the exact strength for each set of, each pair of needles. They're paired. And you don't turn it on and zip it way up and, you know, set it to stun or anything like that. It's very mild and we use different frequencies depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So at lower frequencies, you can get good pain control. At higher frequencies, you can open up channels and promote stem cell production or promote um, the relief of stagnation. So there are lots of different recipes for doing this. The, the final strength of, of where you get on that frequency is always determined by the animal's response. So... We've had animals that look like they're really super uncomfortable and um, visibly everything looks like it's okay. And you back it down a little bit and they relax and they're like, okay, I feel better now. So it's always titrated to how the animal's doing with that particular uh, pair of, of um, electro points. And then acupressure. So acupressure is used primarily in two ways, at least by me. And so the first way is in exam rooms. If your animal's stressed um, or freaking out a little bit, we have points behind the ear called on shen and our nurses pretty much all know to rub those. It's something that most animal owners do instinctively to their cats and dogs because it's very calming. So you're rubbing back there and it just it causes relaxation. Um, so we do things like that, acupressure when a dog is stressed in the room. Or sometimes I might tell my clients, okay, your dog's not eating well, I want you to massage at the, the junction between a haired and non-haired portion of the nose, and that's gonna help increase appetite. Or else your dog is really anxious, so you can rub their wrist down here in this little hole that you feel. And if you massage that, it might help them to feel calmer. So we can give you certain points to massage or push on for 10 minutes a day that can help continue your animal's progress or your pet's progress at home. And then the last one that I kind of, I grouped in with acupuncture um, at, at the Chi Institute, which is where most of the veterinarians that do acupuncture are trained, which it's not far away, it's up near Gainesville. Um, they have another class called Tui Na, and that's basically a type of Chinese massage that uses acupoints and different techniques to help um, move energy and, and cure diseases, treat diseases and, and problems. And a few of us are certified in that and can show you how to do different types of massage to help your animal feel better. So diet and nutrition. Um, <clears throat> separate from all of the normal things that we do here, being an integrative practice. So obviously we want whole foods and we want healthy organic foods when possible. And we talk a lot about that in rotating proteins. All foods have energies. Every food, every treat, every supplement, and really every medicine has a unique energy on the body. And so if your dog has a heat pattern, we're typically going to put them on a cooling food like turkey or rabbit. If your dog is really deficient and really cold, we're gonna put them on something that maybe tonifies chi like beef. So there are a lot of ways to use food to treat the disease process for people that are able and willing to do that for their, their pets. And it's very interesting, and that's another whole segment that you can delve really deeply into. I really like this a lot because you can put an animal on, 
turkey if they have excessive diarrhea and cool that down and they feel great or say they've had GI problems for a long time. If you have a dog that's really struggling and doesn't have a whole lot of energy and they've been eating chicken, you can put them on a beef-based diet and you'll see that energy come up almost all by itself without having to do anything else. So, so food as medicine is a really cool concept. And then herbal remedies, of course. So these are typically prescribed as capsules or tea pills. Tea pills are kind of little um, pills that are covered with a almost molasses coating, but then a hard shellac, so it's not really gooey or sticky. And then they also come as just loose powders. And the herbal remedies can vary in effectiveness based on how they're growing, grown and how they're processed, and really even can have problems. So a lot of these come from China, and you can get heavy metal toxicity if you're not careful with your sourcing. So we only use herbs from a very few pharmacies that we trust that we know are batch testing, not only for um, correctness. So is this the right herb? We're also looking to make sure they're testing for heavy metals and other toxins that might possibly be in with that batch so that your animal doesn't get sick. Okay, and this statistic I just thought was interesting. 65% of patients that were being treated at Colorado State University's Animal Cancer Center were using complementary medicine like acupuncture and herbal therapy along with traditional therapies. And this study was pretty old. It was the most recent one I could find, but it was from about 10 years ago. So I'm positive that number is higher. Um, the interesting thing about that is just that most specialists are not versed in this type of medicine, and so if you go in and say that your animal's on this herb or this supplement or, or getting acupuncture, their immediate go-to is to be worried and afraid of what interactions you might be having or what complications you might have. Um, here, we do a lot of that together all the time, so we have a, a better grasp on what things are safe and what things are not and also a better grasp of what the herbs do. So when we have the occasion that some of our patients go for additional treatment elsewhere, we're usually able to talk with the oncologist or the other internists pretty well about um, what complications might arise and help you guys decide if you need to discontinue herbal therapies or how we would alter anything to go along with the traditional medicine they might be getting. So Chinese veterinary medicine works by creating and maintaining balance. And a balanced body system will be able to protect itself from pathogens and will avoid disease symptoms. And you can see the little balanced rocks to kind of indicate that. And this is just a quote that I really love. And it says that just as chi energy flows through the meridians to bring harmony to the mind, body, and spirit, so must the pure intent and healing energy of the veterinarian. The evolution of a masterful healer is accomplished through gratitude, practice, patience, experience, and integration of all acquired medical knowledge from the East and the West. And that's pretty much it. So hopefully you guys aren't all too confused. Um, thanks so much for coming. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to do you wanna do the, them. Um, you want to do the quiz thing? Yeah, we can hand out the quizzes and see if anyone wants to take them. In the live video.